So leadership and self-development. My first bullet point that I want you to write down is leadership is synonymous with influence. Or as John Maxwell puts it in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. That's how he articulates it. And so instead of looking at leadership, okay, so how can we be more influential? How can I influence? How can I get people to do what I hope they would do that's in their best interest? How can I help them make good choices? Can I be influential? That's really the question. And so I kind of break this into two subcategories. So one A and one B, if you will, on how to be influential. So A is you have to be the role model that you want from your people. It's like I've learned as a father, I've got three kids. My kids don't care what I say. They care what I do. My kids don't learn with their ears. They learn with their eyes. What dad does is what they're paying attention to, not what dad says. Okay, so uh, just an interesting um, example from this weekend. I met up with an old friend I haven't seen in a while, and she lost 25 pounds since last time I saw her. Now, I didn't, I didn't bring this topic up. That's, not, that's kind of rude. Just, hey, have you lost weight? That could be interpreted a bunch of different ways. So I didn't bring it up. She brought it up. And, of course, I asked the golden question that I've asked over the years many times. Like, oh, what did you do? Hoping to hear a different answer than the basic formula that I know to be true is you need to move more and eat less. Isn't that the answer? I was hoping there's something like, hey, Jamie, have you heard about this pill called XYZ? No, tell me about it. Oh, listen, it's totally organic. It's healthy. There's no side effects. And you just shed weight. Sign me up. But she's telling me, oh, listen, you know, I'm just, I'm working out more. I'm eating uh, better food and I'm, I'm eating less food. And this is how I lost 25 pounds. And so when I, I'm bringing that story up because at the end of the day, you've got to do the work. You can't get around not being the role model. There's just no way around it. You've got to be the example that you want from your people. You've got to work hard at this thing. So understand that whole role, role modeling. It's like the first one in the field, right? Like that, that's just kind of a good reputation for you to have that you're, you and your people are competing with who's the first one in the field. You're competing with Who's doing the last door? I've been to conferences like this. I remember one time in particular, because I take pride in being one of the first guys here and one of the last to leave. And we called the truce at the end of the night to, to walk out of the conference room at the end of the night at around close to one o'clock in the morning because I wanted to be the last one. He wanted to be the last one, so we just stepped out together. But that's a nice reputation to have. You've got to be the role model that you want for your people. Okay, whatever you want from them, you got to model it. Don't, don't throw it out with words. Throw it out with action. B is you have to sincerely care. Now, I, I believe this to be true. Animals, dogs can sense fear. Have you guys noticed this throughout your lives? If you're scared, they can tell, right? Like, oh, this big dog, he's going to bite me, and you go to pet it, like, he's probably going to bite you because you can sense fear. Well, if, if a dog is smart enough to sense fear, I believe that humans are smart enough to sense a lack of sincerity. Oh, you're telling me what I want to hear because you want something from me. So the question is, do you genuinely, genuinely and sincerely care about your people? Now, years ago, so I, I used to make these little cards. It was the size of a credit card, and I put my company values on the cards, and I came up with 10 values Anybody got promoted to leadership? I'm like, here's your card. Let's embody these values. And I had one of my best sales reps come into my office. And he says to me, he says, Jamie, you know, listen, I love the company and I love my experience working here. And of course, I love working with him. He's a, one of my best producers. He says, I've just, there, I've just got, it's kind of sitting with me wrong. It's not sitting well. I want to talk to you about this because I'm not sure how to unpack this. But number nine says to genuinely and sincerely care about your people. I'm kind of like, where is this going? He says, listen, I don't hope people do poorly by any means. I just think it's on them. It's not on me. As you can tell, I'm a competitor and I want to win. Anytime there's a contest, I'm competing. I perform. And again, I don't want to see other people not do well. I just don't know if I genuinely care the way you're asking me to care about the people that I'm training. But that's up to them. 
I'm like, you know, this is a real thoughtful conversation. I appreciate this conversation. And we talked it through. And by the end of the conversation, again, there was no ill will or anything overly weird. We just both came to terms that he's in the wrong business. And I really believe if you really do a self-inventory and you take a really good look in the mirror, if you too kind of think that way where it's like, well, listen, I'm a performer. Like you guys are 90 days plus in the business. You've been around the block. You obviously know how to take care of yourselves. You are a performer. Otherwise, you know, you would have left a long time ago. But the question is, do you really care about people or not? And if you get to the point where you're like, I don't really think so. There is a place for you in the marketplace. This guy went on to the refinance business. He was selling mortgages and he was one of the best guys in mortgages. He found a career for himself. There is a place in the marketplace for somebody who's a great performer, just doesn't really want to work in a team environment. You could sell real estate to make a fortune. You saw uh, Toronto prices last I checked are a little high. You can make a fortune in real estate, but if, you're, if you just lack that sincere interest in others, you really are in the wrong space. So I think that's something to really think about. And I don't really have a, you know, a one-two punch, like here's the, uh, here's the four things now on how to care about people. It's really just a question. So maybe the question that you might be asking yourself is like, well, no, Jamie, I really do genuinely care. Maybe a question you could ask yourself is how do you show it? Like, if you really do care, like, do others know that? Like, are you taking an interest? Are you asking them questions? Are you getting them to talk? Are, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Are you talking once and listening twice? But maybe ask yourself, you know, do you genuinely care? But I really believe if you do those two things, if you're the example that you want your people to be, and then number two, you genuinely care about the people that you're working with, you will be influential. Okay. Leadership is synonymous with influence. Okay, so that's bullet point number one. Number two is duplication. Now, I always have to make sure that this is safe before I unpack this. So, does anybody here own a Nissan Juke? Just a show of hands. Okay, nobody. Does anybody's parents work for Nissan head office? Okay, we're safe. All right, so here we go. So listen, I've been a, I'm a Nissan fan, okay? I've been driving Nissans my whole life. I, I don't drive one today, but for years I've had lots of Nissans. A big fan of the Maxima, big fan of the Pathfinder, the Altima, the Rogue. I mean, I've had all those vehicles. And then one day I walked past the Juke, and I'm like, what is that, right? And I, and I saw it from the back at first, and I walked to the front, and I was shocked to see the beautiful Nissan round logo on the front of this thing. And I'm like, somebody made the executive decision at head office Nissan to mass produce this piece of junk. <laughs> right, like it's got these awkward blind spots. It's just, it looks awkward. It's probably gutless. I think it's got a two liter in, or a four cylinder, two liter. Like, I don't know, it's just 2.0, 2 like it's, yeah. So before we get into the mass production business, like the way I look at it, like I want to create the, a great prototype, like the Maxima. I want to be the Maxima, and then I want to mass produce this thing a million times over. And that's what's supposed to happen. You, you tinker around in the laboratory, and you come up with this great prototype, and then you take it to market. Again, I just don't want to take the Nissan Juke to market, or you guys have heard the stories too of like recalls that happen in vehicles that some companies have a a recall that costs them like 50 cents, you know, doesn't cost a lot, but all the, the pain in the butt to bring all the vehicles back in and tweak something, fix it. I mean, gee, like you don't want to, you don't want to mass produce flaws. So as I look at the business, listen, I'm in the duplication business. So my question is, what am I multiplying? If I'm multiplying this, right, this prototype called Jamie Hep. Well, I got to take a good look at my personal inventory and say, well, I got to get rid of some of these flaws before it goes to market. I got to turn the juke into the maxima somehow. So my short list, I've got a short list of features that I believe we, we want to reproduce in our maximas here. And so the first thing I want to produce is high character. Little things like when you go, you know, you take your lunch break at Subway and you say, oh, I'll have the 12 inch whatever and just a cup of water is fine. 
Do you fill it with Coke? Or do you fill it with water like you said you would? Because if you do fill it with Coke, the people that you're bringing into your business are going to be like, oh, yeah, you can take some shortcuts. You can save yourself a couple bucks. I you know. And if the guy's like, yeah, I like this guy. I like this hustler guy. You're going to potentially mass produce flawed, a flawed character crew. And I've seen this happen in the business where a flawed character crew has grown and we've got just big problems. You imagine if we represent a client like Amazon and we've got that kind of fill it up with Coke mentality when we didn't pay for it, multiplied a bunch of times over, Amazon wouldn't do business with us. What our clients love about us is when we have a problem, not if we have a problem, again, when we have an issue, man, we are on it, we are quick, it doesn't happen often. Our clients really believe that we care more about their brand than their own people care about their brand. That's the reputation we have. This is why our clients are knocking on our door. This is why you have Costco knocking on your door here in Canada saying, hey, can you guys represent us? You're kind of like, uh, yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to start some retail business up here. So high character, I want to reproduce high character. So I got to take a look at my inventory. Am I a character driven per person? If I say I'm going to do something, do I do it? Or am, just, am I just loosey goosey with my word? I say, yeah, I'll be a team night. And then team night rolls around. Well, I don't really feel like it, so I'm not going to go. Well, you gave your word. I mean, isn't your word your bond? That's old school, how my grandpa used to do business. It was, everything was on a handshake. I don't care what country you're from. That's how all of our ancestors used to do business. It was a handshake. We didn't need legal contracts back then. You only need legal contracts if there's something shady going on. I don't want to do anything shady. I want to be a man of my word. I want to be a man of character. So I want to mass produce that. Here's a great line that I tell my kids all the time. Listen, charisma opens doors. No question. Charisma opens doors. Character, character keeps your foot in the door. So sure, you want to work on your charisma. I want to open up doors. But it's your character that keeps you in the door. I want to multiply positive attitude, especially during adversity. I remember the first time I saw my leader experience a mean customer. It didn't happen very often. I'm like, well, I've been kind of waiting for this. I expected more of that, right? And he, he handled it so well. And he totally did, you know, disarmed this customer. And I kept thinking to myself, I want what he has. I want that level of swag that I can take an angry, mean customer and make him happy within 30 seconds. I'm like, I need to learn this skill. I was turned on to adversity and, and his positive attitude. So I want to model positive attitude. You don't want to be, so again, just take a look at your inventory. Do you complain? I tell my kids, complaining is a sign of being spoiled. And there's an easy way to fix complaining. I'll just take stuff away. So you won't be spoiled. Oh, dad, no, don't do that. Well, then don't complain. But complainers, no way. We don't want to be complainers. We want to have a great attitude, positive mental attitude. I learned as a new person coming in, PMA equals OPM. Positive mental attitude equals other people's money. I want to model a great work ethic. I want to model high standards. I mean, we all get to choose. You think about this. We get to choose our standards on how you roll, the reputation, how, how you wear your family jersey, whether you know it or not. You have a jersey that you're wearing, and on the back is your last name. Are people buying this jersey? Yes or no. But you have to choose how your family reputation is being represented. Do you choose a poor standard, an average standard, a fair standard, a good standard, a great standard, or an excellent standard? Now, in my household... We, I'm raising my kids with four core values. It uh, stands for life, L-I-F-E. Leadership, integrity, faith, and excellence. And we are to hold each other accountable, dad included, mom included. Uh, we hold each other accountable that if there's anything off with these values, we can call it out. And so something that seems to happen often is if my kids have the chores of cleaning up the kitchen, sometimes I'll come in after and I'm like, uh, hey, you know, not a great job in here. Let's come with me so you can see what I see. Hey, I'm just curious if we should change the values. I always frame it this way, and it, you know, they, they don't really like it, but I'm like, I'm thinking we should change the values to lift them. 
L-I-F-M, leadership, integrity, faith, and mediocrity. Think we should do that? Should we change it to mediocrity? No, Dad. Should we keep it at excellent? Yeah, Dad. Do you want to do it again? Yeah. And then I always say, if you don't have time to do things right, when are you going to have time to do things over again? Like if it's all about time management, and that's why you're, you're cutting corners from excellence down the line to a different standard, well, re really, if you're all about time management, then you need to roll to the tune of excellence because then you don't have to do anything over again. You want to get out of the field faster? Again, if it's all about time, you got to roll with excellence. You can't roll with mediocrity, fair, good, or even great. Great isn't good enough. You've got to be excellent. You've got to be outstanding. So you want to model high standards. I tell my kids all the time, I'll just kind of end this point here. I'm like, I really don't care what you want to do with your life as far as a career goes. And whether you want to be a doctor, you want to be an ambulance driver, you want to be a chef. I mean, I really don't care. All I know is in the bell curve of life, no matter what industry, no matter what job you pick, those in the top 5% of the bell curve are all making money. There's opportunity in every industry. So all I care about is that you work with excellence. That's what I care about. I don't want to go to your, my middle child uh, wants to run a bakery. I don't want to go to her bakery and it's a mediocre bakery. I want it to be excellent so I can get all the freebies and be her best customer sitting at her bakery every day but you gotta roll to the tune of excellence, okay? So duplication, what are you duplicating? The third thing I have for you is fail. A common question that I get asked is, well, Jamie, if you knew back then what you know now, what would you do differently? It's a common question. And then you think about it, well, if I knew all the potholes on the map, on the journey, if I knew I don't, 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 okay, so just go this way and you'll avoid all the mistakes. If that's how we walk through life is, I want to walk through life avoiding mistakes, inevitably what you're avoiding in the process is success. The only way through success is through failure. Sorry, the only way to success is through failure. You got to fail. If you want to double your success rate, then double your failure rate. Like hurry up and fail. Carol Dweck wrote a great book called Mindset, right? She talks about the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And she says the fixed mindset is belief that your abilities are innate and cannot be changed. The growth mindset is a belief that your abilities can be developed and improved over time. But look to fail. I mean, you think about it, growth comes from pain. Like you almost got to gravitate to pain. I mean, an interesting little historical fact is Muhammad Ali, do you know how many reps that he would do? Do you guys know how he'd count the reps when he, when he was training? Yeah. Only when pain kicked in did he start the count. All the pre-pain repetitions didn't matter. It wasn't painful enough to count, so just keep doing it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay, now the pain's settling in. Okay, now it's time to do 50 reps once the pain hits. You want to grow a muscle, you've got to tear the muscle. You've got to fail. You've got to rip your body apart. So be attracted to failure. Don't be attracted to, to avoiding mistakes. I tell everybody, listen, make all the mistakes you can. Like tonight, you've got, to, you've got to get out of jail free pass from me. You can blame me tonight. If you party too hard tonight and the owner's giving you a rough time, hey, listen, Jamie said, Hey, make that mistake. No, party too hard. Show up late to your office on Tuesday. Like, hey, no problem. Make that mistake. Make every mistake. Try to only make this, a mistake once. Like, if you have to keep making the same mistake over and over again, like, you got brains? <laughs> you know, like, you shouldn't have to keep making the same mistakes. Just make them all. Just don't make the fatal two. I always say just avoid the fatal two. Everything, you can make the other... 998,000, you know, whatever many mistakes there are. Make them all. Just don't make these two. The mistake of poor character, where you fraud a customer, you cheat a customer, like you can't lie. That's a fatal mistake. You'll get terminated through that. Or don't make the fatal mistake of quitting. There's no bouncing back from quitting. How do you bounce back from a quit? 
I like saying this, this line a lot. You'll never hear somebody successful say, yeah, I just quit my way to the top. That's how I became successful. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so be attracted to failure. And then the fourth thing I have for you, my last bullet point, is WIIFM radio. WIIFM radio. Tune in. What's in it for me? WIIFM. What's in it for me? Why should I follow you? Why should I stick around? If you're not sure where you're going, how can you convince someone else to follow? It's like my kids when they try something gross, like, oh, dad, this is gross. Here, try. I'm like, say that again? Yeah, it's disgusting. Just try it, dad. I'm like, you got to work on your pitch. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not really sure I want to try that <laughs> based on the look on your face. Like, if you're like, oh, dad, this is delicious. I'm like, well, let me try. I mean, it's the same thing as you saying, listen, I'm not sure if this business is for me, but hey, you should come follow. It's the same logic. So you've got to have some, you've got to be convinced. You've got to commit to, you know, that you've got something great to offer yourself first. And then you've got something great to offer others. You've got to sell you first before you can ever recruit anybody else. Like, it's okay if you go up to the owner and say, hey, listen, I don't know if I want another recruit. i got to kind of get some cobwebs out of my brain first because I haven't sold me yet. And if I can't sell me, I can't sell anybody else. Hmm. If somebody said that to me, I'd be like, hey, this, this sounds like a great conversation. I'm not upset about it. I mean, been there, done that myself. I know how you feel. Like, I'll relate to you 100%. Well, Jamie, how did you get on solid ground? How did you get solidified? Well, here's what happened to me. And I think when people go through that process and then they do get on solid ground, I find that they have a really easy time convincing other people. But you got to sell you first. And so what's in it for me mentality, listen, what you really want is people looking at you like, dude, you're going places. There's no question about it. You are going somewhere. I just want to hang on to your coattails and go for a ride. I think that's what happened with Jeff Bezos, Mark Cuban, a lot of these heavyweights that we, you know, that are household names. These guys had nothing at one point in time. I was lucky enough to have uh, dinner one night with um, Steve Wozniak, who's one of the founders of Apple, right? And I'm kind of like, oh, what a great opportunity this is. I got all these great questions about when, when Apple was just a new startup with a high chance of failure. Like, what was going through your mind? And what did you think? And like, what was the toughest challenge? And like, did you ever think it would you know, be like this? But there were, there were people that were joining his business and Steve Jobs' business that just, hey, you know, it, it's hard to put the logic together on how this thing is actually going to compete and do well. They're just so convinced themselves. I just want to, I want to go along for the ride. These guys are going somewhere. Apple's going to be something one day. And we all know how that story is. An anonymous president of the United States once said, I'll give you his quote. If you have to think anyway, why not think big? You can probably guess who said that, but it's an anonymous president. One of 46 options you have. So be a big thinker. People are attracted to big talk. My leader talked big game. He'd come into the office with, with this Rob Report magazine. It was basically the lifestyles of the rich and famous. And I never met anybody that was thinking like this. This one day he brought in a picture of this home that actually I heard that Drake, I pa we passed by Drake's neighborhood here in Toronto, and, and uh, somebody was saying, yeah, Drake has a bed apparently worth $400,000, made from horsehair or something like that. You guys probably know better than me because we're in Toronto. And I'm like, $400,000 for a bed. But anyway, Rob showed me this home and then the master bedroom was a retractable roof and a hoist on the bed. So if you want to just kind of be outside while you're laying in bed, you hit a couple buttons and this thing hoists up. And I'm like, he's like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have something like that, but I'm, it's kind of getting me thinking, Jamie. And I'm kind of like, again, none of my friends ever thought like that. <laughs> big picture where I'm from is if you have enough money for a case of beer on the weekend. That's the big picture. Like, you know, how many beers, you know, do you have money for? And they say that a stretched mind never goes back to its original shape. 
So once you stretch a mind, once you get people thinking big, they're not going back to little thinking anymore. So don't be shy to be a big picture person. Like throw yourself out there. Be a little vulnerable. I think people are a little shy to do it because, well, you haven't done it yet and you're going to look like a kook. But if you back it up with daily action, so as crazy as Rob might have been, he, again, he didn't say he'd have a hoist uh, in his master bedroom. He's just showing me pictures. He's trying to, he's trying to think it through. He's, he's, he's designing his home as he's living in some crappy apartment. But he'd back up his goals on a daily basis. He talked the talk and he walked the walk. I had no reason to believe that Rob wasn't going to do these big picture things, of which he did do. He did become an owner. He did do big things. He's been an entrepreneur ever since. So Rob was stretching my brain and I never went back to the original shape. So what's in it for me? Everybody's thinking like that. So people are joining your business. Hey, what's in it for me? They might not be saying it in those particular words, but they're thinking and they're watching. And if they're looking at you like, dude, you are going somewhere, they're going to latch onto your coattails. They're going to want to go around uh, for the ride.